Hey, Mr. P here. It's Mr. Schmitz. In this video, we're going to talk specifically about niche and the competitive exclusion principle. You remember what we talked about last time? <laughs> I do not. <laughs> last time, we talked about the human population. We talked about how the human population grew exponentially for a period of time and how it has now been slowing down for about the last 70 years, and we are arguably entering a phase of logistic growth, but that we do not know what our carrying capacity yet is. And I do recall now, we had a discussion about what researchers think the carrying capacity was, which we believe to be between 8 billion and 20 billion. Correct. All right, in this video, we're going to, like I said, talk about niche and competitive exclusion principles. So what is a niche? A niche is where an organism lives, but also what it does for a living. So a lot of people confuse a niche with a habitat, but a niche is much more than just the habitat. It does include where it lives, but it also includes the role that the organism plays. That's kind of the defining phrase that we use a lot of time. It's the role that the organism plays in its environment. And I wasn't aware, but I just learned the other day that there's a difference between the fundamental and realized niche. Have you heard those terms? I have heard those terms, yes. So the fundamental niche is the niche where the organism could theoretically live. Right. But realized niche would be where it chooses to live. Right. And it also has to do a little bit with competition. So the fundamental niche is like under perfect conditions, if they had no other organisms competing, what could they possibly do? But the realized niche would be through the interactions with the other species around it. This is where it ends up filling a role and what it ends up doing. So... I guess a little misconception when I say they choose, a lot of times maybe the competition chooses for them or pushes them into their realized niche despite them having chosen that. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Very good. So when we look at a particular example like these anole lizards, there's a specific tree in this case which is full of resources, which could be what? Uh, in this tree you could have food resources, you could have space resources, there's prey for these lizards, food options, there's space for them to live, space for them to reproduce and have shelter. Uh, and so what we see is that there would be competition for those resources in this tree. And so if they decide they need to decrease competition, they're going to seek shelter and seek locations within the tree that maybe have decreased competition or an abundance of food that isn't utilized by another organism in the same tree. So we refer to that as resource partitioning. So resource partitioning is the sharing of a resource as a way to decrease that direct competition. What this does is it allows for multiple species then to exist in the same place at the same time and form slightly different niches in an area so that they can still exist but not directly compete with one another. If all four of the species of anole lizards in this picture were directly competing for the exact same food source, three of them would lose that competition and one species would become dominant. But because they're sharing this tree in slightly different ways, and as you can see from where they're being illustrated at, they're, they're taking up a different space in that tree and eating different food that way, they're able to decrease that competition and all coexist. And while looking at this, I noticed that there are differences in the body structure, the composition of these lizards. Some of them have shorter legs than others, and we'll get into that when we talk about evolution and natural selection. Related to acquiring the resources uh, dictates in a large part kind of the, the traits that are exhibited over time. Absolutely. That competition would be what we call a selective pressure for those species. And so what I hear you saying is that these lizards, in order to utilize different resources and decrease competition, have to evolve certain characteristics that allow them to utilize resources that the others can't use. That's absolutely correct. And uh, while we're talking about trees, some of the other examples that, I mean, these examples are, are everywhere in nature, but there's another example of warbler finches that would be illustrated this very same way. Right? Certain species are going to live more high in the canopy and certain species of birds even are going to live more towards the ground um, based on the, the utilization of resources and insects that they consume. Absolutely, and that allows those multiple species to evolve and decrease that competition. So the idea with resource partitioning and with niches is that by sharing the resource in a slightly different way, it allows for more species to exist in an area. Uh, and that's because they're decreasing their competition. So up next we have a discussion of competition. So how do we define competition? Competition occurs when more than one organism, and that can be same species organisms or different, utilize the same limited ecological resources in the same place at the same time. 
And so you can see in the bottom picture, this is obviously a bunch of buzzards or vultures that are utilizing a kill or a food source. These are all members of the same species. We call that intraspecific competition. And when you look at the top picture, that obviously shows lions and hyenas. That would be members of different species, and so we call that interspecific competition. And so both of these types of competition can drive species behavior, and it can drive the niche that a species exists within because it's going to determine how successful species are at acquiring food or shelter or mates or things like that. Yeah, and it, I was just going to say, it's really important to know that while we think of competition as the acquisition of food, that's probably one of the biggest forms of competition because food and water are one of the most important necessities for life. It is important to note that mate selection and mating rights drives a lot of competition as well within intraspecific competition. Typically, organisms aren't going to fight with other organisms for mating rights. Correct. And this brings us to something called the competitive exclusion principle. So when we look at competition, uh, what we find is that nature has winners and losers. And so what you're looking at is a graph here. We're going to kind of talk through what this exhibits here and what it shows. And then hopefully we can, through that, understand what competitive exclusion is. So if we just take a moment to look at our graph, we have a couple of lines. We have two species of bacteria, Aurelia and Caudatum. Uh, and what you can see is that we allowed each of them to grow alone in a Petri dish. That's the dotted lines. And what do you notice when they're growing alone, Mr. Pfeiffer? They are thriving and reach the highest level of their population density and actually kind of end at the same density when they are grown alone. But when we put them together into one Petri dish, we notice with the solid lines that the bacteria directly compete with one another and it results in one of the bacteria after a couple of weeks going completely extinct mm -hmm. and the other one reaching a carrying capacity but a much lower carrying capacity. So yes, it is important to note that when you look at these two, and I know that there are only two colors, you have blue and you have red, the blue dotted line and the red dotted line would be indicative of them grown separately and alone. So when they are exclusive or have exclusive rights to the resources in that particular culture, they grow very well and grow really quickly. Obviously, from our last lectures, you would notice that this is an exponential growth and they reach a carrying capacity. They grow very well. As soon as you give them competition, one of them, in this case, the red, is going to outcompete the blue. And you can see very quickly that the blue actually gets outcompeted and uh, reaches extinction, in this case, on day 14 whereas the red culture or red species would obviously win and reach its carrying capacity, but like you said, the carrying capacity is much reduced. So by definition, the competitive exclusion principle is where no two species can occupy the same niche at the same time. So when we put those two organisms together in the same place, one of them ultimately loses and one of them ultimately wins. The only way that species combat this is what we saw earlier, which would be resource partitioning. If these two species found a way to shift how they were consuming or utilizing those resources, then potentially they could coexist. But if you are directly competing for the same resource and the same niche, one will win and one will lose. And that reminds me of one of our last videos. We talked about invasive species and how big of a deal it was. I believe you brought up the toads. Yes, the cane toad. The, yeah, the dinner sized plate toads dinner plate sized toads. And so I'm just kind of circling back that the competitive exclusion principle that we're talking about right here is the reason that invasive species are bad. Yes, because invasive species are very well adapted to outcompete those native species. And so they are usually the ones that would be like the line that's red that are outcompeting the native species causing native species to go extinct. Right. Do you have any examples of that in nature um, specifically? I do. So we have, at least in our local environments, in our local lake, the introduction of zebra mussels is an invasive species that decimated the local mussel population and actually decreases the productivity of the fishery a lot. And there's a lot of regulations around our state and around our country in order to try to decrease the spread of the zebra mussels. Yeah, I've seen a lot of the washing your boat mm -hmm. um, and you can't leave with a, a boat unless it's been cleaned and dried and things like that at a lot of those lakes. Yep. And so to kind of pull it all together, when we talk about the competitive exclusion principle, organisms that are identifying competition and feeling the pressure or the squeeze of competition are going to find ways naturally to reduce the competition. And so one way that they would do that 
for instance, is there are two organisms in Australia, koalas and greater gliders, eat exactly the same thing, eucalyptus leaves, Mm -hmm. and live in the same environment at the same place at the same time. So by all accounts would have very high pressures, but they have, in order to avoid competition, found ways to live and be active at very different times. Koalas are nocturnal, while the greater gliders are crepuscular, which means they're active at dawn and dusk. Wow. So that is a great example of resource partitioning because they are using basically the exact same resources like you just illustrated for us, but they happen to be changing the time of day that they're accessing those resources, which is what is allowing them to coexist at the same time. Right. Nature. That's all we've got for you today, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Subscribe to the channel. We'll see you next time.